Hi, Jeff. Good morning. Hey, how are you? Yeah, doing good. Thanks. Doing good. How are you? Very well. Not very well, but yeah, considering <laughs> as well as I can realistically be doing under the circumstances. 2020 has even changed the standard British, I'm fine. I think <laughs> even that default has been nudged a little bit. So. Wow. And you all are famous for understatement. So that is really saying something. I know, it's serious. It's getting serious. So, um, But thank you so much for making the time to join these uh, one of these sentientist conversations. And Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. And uh, it's the first time we've spoken outside of text really through yeah, messages yeah, or on the Facebook group. Yeah, it really group. is. So it's nice to have a proper conversation. To attach a, a face and a, an accent and a background to the sentientist label and uh, <laughs> yeah. all the Twitter and Facebook exchanges. Yeah, it's good to put a face to the face to the online blathering at least. Yeah. Uh, so the idea behind these conversations is part of yeah, this idea of trying to recast the term of sentientism and popularize it. And it's mm-hmm trying to be a really simple pluralistic philosophy, a common sense mm-hmm. philosophy, if you like, that just answers the two deepest questions, what's real and what matters. So these mm-hmm. conversations are really understanding, I guess, your personal philosophical journey as you've answered those questions and how that, those views have shifted over, your, over time. And I'm talking to people who agree with the sentientist philosophy and disagree with it, but you know, mm-hmm. we'll see where we go. And, and in simple terms, the way I'm framing sentientism is it's a combination of when thinking about what's real, it answers with nat- we should use a naturalistic approach and very broadly defined. So we should use evidence and reason mm-hmm. to form probabilistic, provisional, prudent beliefs, have humility, be open-minded, you know, in the best conception of a scientific worldview, a naturalistic worldview. And when it comes to what matters, the, cl- the clue is in the name. It's just we should draw our moral considerability by sentience, the, the capacity mm-hmm. to have subjective experiences. And, and that mm-hmm. really is it. It's neutral on almost everything else. Um, but yeah, as I yeah. said, we'll, we'll see how the conversation goes and where you agree and disagree. <laughs> yeah, um, right, right, yeah. Definitely. But before we get into the, how you answer those two deep questions, it would be great for people who don't know your work if you could just introduce yourself and your focus. Sure. My name is Jeff Sebo, and I teach environmental studies along with bioethics, medical ethics, philosophy at New York University, and I direct the Animal Studies MA program there. My background is in philosophy. I have a PhD in philosophy with a focus on moral and political philosophy from New York University. And over the years have basically worked more and more on animal ethics and environmental ethics and related topics. So for example, I have worked on legal rights for non-human animals, on food animals in the environment. I have an upcoming book on animals, pandemics and climate change. And so I try to generally do work grounded in philosophy, but in a multidisciplinary spirit that integrates animal and environmental issues along with human rights and social justice issues. And that is in some sense in collaboration with advocates and policymakers and other people doing change-making work in the space. So that is what I do for a living. Uh, I, I live in Brooklyn with my partner and my dog. And yeah, otherwise, basically, I'm just spending all of my time at this desk or on my couch this year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah on Zoom calls like this one. Sorry to add another mm-hmm. to the list. And that was one of the reasons I was so excited to get the chance to talk to you, because you've you bust across a lot of in academic silos, but you also are very keen to make sure you're not just stuck in some academic world. You're actually out in the world engaging with activists and trying to make change happen as well. So it resonates with many of the themes in these conversations. That's great to hear. So if we start with that first question of what's real, for many people, that's a story of whether they grew up in a naturalistic or an atheistic environment or a religious Mm. or a supernatural environment, how they're thinking on the, I guess, the epistemology of what's real and how do we understand reality around us has changed over time. So it'd be fascinating to know your story and you can reach as far back into your personal history as you like. Sure. So it depends on how much detail you want to hear. I am very happy to share a lot of detail. Mm. I grew up in a religious household. I, my mom was actually, or is a music minister oh, yeah. at various Protestant churches. So Presbyterian and Methodist churches, I think mostly. And so I grew up in, in these Christian churches and that was nice. And my parents never pressured me to go through the whole process of getting confirmed or whatever. But over time, I got into the community anyway. I was, I I think, a little bit skeptical 
for most of my young life, but then around early high school, I started hanging out at the church a little bit more and they asked me to be a youth group minister for the middle school students. And so I started doing volunteer work, working with the middle school students. And then I started to join them on mission house building trips. And that felt meaningful at the time. Yeah. And so by the time I graduated high school, I was actually quite invested in my identity as a Christian like person who was interested in being involved with the church. And I thought I might even be interested in going into the ministry as my mom had with her musical work and as her father had as a minister. Yeah, yeah. And then I went to college at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. And Texas Christian University was a really interesting place to go to school because it was and is by and large a liberal arts university with a liberal arts faculty. But because of the word Christian in the name and because of a formal affiliation with the Disciples of Christ, the students are by and large Christian and Texan conservative, et cetera. Yeah. So you have an interesting sort of ideological or cultural clash between the students and the faculty. Yeah. And it was really interesting to attend college there as a young Christian because the first three weeks or so of my college education, I was exposed left and right to all sorts of arguments and information that challenged my religious beliefs. I got hit with the youth of pro problem and the mind body problem and debunking explanations of religious belief and so on and so forth. Problem of evil. Wow. And all so at I once. would say, yeah, all at once uh, <laughs> across classes. And, and so I think it was probably maybe three or four weeks before I had a major faith crisis and lost my faith and then decided that I needed to study philosophy to try to figure that stuff out. Yeah. And, and that's, so, quite yeah, a quick, I, that's quite a quick yeah. radical process because many of the people I've spoken <laughs> to, it's been quite great. And for me, it was as well. It's quite gradual. It yeah. was a teenage thing. It took a process of years, but well, it sounds it, like it you went through think, quite a crucible of sort of three or four weeks of bang. It's yeah. Hitting I, I, you might think that the arguments and information were really good and it was to my credit that I was persuaded by them. <laughs> but, but, but I actually think the truth is that I never really believed the Christian stuff in the first place as much as I thought I did. Yeah, yeah. I think that I believed in the metaphysical and epistemological commitments of Christianity, but in fact was just invested in the community yeah. uh, and in, in that set of values and practices. And the metaphysical and epistemological commitments were window dressing. Yeah. So I think the fact, yeah. exactly. So I think the fact that I dropped that stuff as quickly as I did was maybe an indication that I wasn't as committed to it as I thought I was at the time. Yeah. So when you, and I think that's common for many people, there's a genuine commitment to the value of belonging and a sense of identity and community and togetherness, but also an expression of compassion as well. As you said, you're doing good works in the community yeah. and trying to help people. Um, and quite often, I think that's true of many people in a religious community is that the epistemological stuff and the supernatural stuff is really a backdrop. Yeah. And I think there are, you know, there's some interesting evidence that of the vast swathes of people in religious communities who aren't really strictly religious. When you're actually check, what, do you believe this and this? The answer is not so much. It's more they're taking... Or they it. might claim to, but then their behavior in yeah. various respects indicates <laughs> yeah. otherwise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, for some people, the, the shift away from that religious worldview is one of evidence and reason and logical consistency and thinking, I'm not sure this hangs together and is the evidence there to support it. For other yeah. people, they'll see some of the there's a lot of good genuine compassion that flows through religious worldviews. There's a lot yeah. of pretty warped ethics as well. So, so for sometimes it's bumping up against seeing some ethics that they don't identify with and going, hold on, that can't be right. Was it a mix of both for you or more of one or of the other? Or Yeah, I think I definitely went through my overcorrecting reactionary atheist phase following my yeah. Christian phase. You know, I discover that there are all these in retrospect kind of obvious problems with the stated beliefs of my faith. And so I vacillate to the other end of the spectrum and say, God is dead and life is absurd. And, <laughs> and this is all so silly and, and so on and so forth. And I probably indulged in that for a little while longer <laughs> than I should yeah. have. But what 19 year old away from home for the first time doesn't yeah, to some yeah. degree do that. But, but thanks in part to those same college professors, as well as then the, the people I worked with in 
graduate school, I was able to reconstruct a more generous interpretation of religious and non-religious beliefs. Basically, by the time I was done with grad school, and we might talk about this more in a bit, I worked with Tom Nagel at the time, had, I think, a Mellon grant to do the science and religion project that convened a bunch of philosophers of science and religion together a few times a year to talk about reconciling religion and science and the deep questions that religion and science are both trying to get to in different ways. And I was lucky to be able to be a fly on the wall in those sessions. And and all of the stuff that I did in college and grad school culminating in those conversations really persuaded me that nobody has any idea what the hell is going on in the universe. And all of our attempts to explain the fundamental nature of reality are at best highly uneducated guesses, whether they are religious or scientific in <laughs> nature. And so where I ended up, if you asked me to state odds, I, I could try to state odds, but where I ended up was basically with a deep humility and yeah. uncertainty about the fundamental nature of reality, whether this is a naturalistic universe all the way down, whether it does bottom out in some kind of supernatural explanation. Are we living in a simulation created yeah. by some teenager doing a science project? Yeah. You know, any one of those things is possible as far as I can tell. Yeah, makes sense. But would it be true to say that that open-mindedness is still open-minded subject to experiencing evidence and following a process of reasoning. Um, to a degree, one way of understanding the difference between science and then philosophy or, or religion is that there is a limit to our ability to empirically yeah. test some of our hypotheses <clears throat> about the nature of the world. We can empirically test hypotheses about the observable part of the world, yeah. but we cannot empirically test hypotheses about the unobservable part of the world. And some of these hypotheses, some of these theories about the fundamental nature of reality might be beyond the reach of yeah. our senses, might be beyond the reach of evidence, perhaps, and reason too, because both evidence and reason are part of the natural world and are limited by some of the features of the natural world. Yeah. So yes, I, I do think that we should use evidence and reason to study what we can, but we should recognize that evidence and reason will not be able to grasp everything there is that might be of interest in the world. Yeah, and I think that's critically important because while there are things, sometimes that the, the limits to our potential knowledge might be temporary because often we are pushing them back and using new instruments. And new, there are, there, it's highly likely there are some things that are, true and real that we will never be able to experience we will never be able to understand and i think right. the, the the word i liked that you said at the beginning of that was that sense of deep humility because it almost feels to me as if there's at least a couple of wrong paths people can take they can either be overconfident and think it's possible to develop perfect knowledge of something and that can take a supernatural form where the revealed god is the answer to all the questions or it can take a scientific form where and sometimes this tone comes across from people who are naturalistic or scientific, that we have all the answers, we can understand everything perfectly. It's only a matter of time before we fill in every single gap in knowledge and there'll be no space for anything else. And I think that's a, that's a problem, partly because that radical open-mindedness and that humility is actually at the essence of a proper naturalistic worldview and a scientific method, which to my mind states that outside of formal systems like maths, which are constructed specifically to enable perfect perfection because it's built into the definitions outside of that real world knowledge uh, i don't think can ever be perfect as you say yeah. you, know, you always reach a point where you say look i've got a very high degree of confidence because of these different sources of evidence and because of the imperfect reasoning i've done it's a high enough level of confidence that i can act and do things and still hold beliefs but they're provisional they're never a hundred percent um and then the other yeah and it sounds like y y you know, you attempted with this at one point, the other extreme is to then abandon all hope and say, we can't know anything at all. There's a complete nihil nihilism and almost a solipsistic view of, yeah. you know, there is no truth, there is no reality. And I think there's yeah, a, that's, the, that's yeah. a middle ground of humility of saying, we might, know, we might not know any, everything perfectly, but we can also know enough to be able to navigate and to cooperate and to provisionally hold belief. But yeah, or whether or not we can know enough, we need to proceed on the assumption that we can because we, we do need to strike a balance here. I, I complete I, I like that way of putting it and and I completely agree 
with you that while we should avoid the hubris of thinking that we know all or most or even some of, of what there is to know <laughs> about the world, we should also avoid the, this very convenient idea that humans are totally incapable of knowing or doing anything. And, and so we have no reason to try to understand the world or make it a better place. I, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle where yes, there are significant limits to our knowledge and power, but we still have a responsibility to try to yeah. improve our knowledge and power and, and then exercise them responsibly. So that might be something that we talk about more, more later, but I just want to note that I fully agree with you about the need to strike a balance there rather than going yeah. too far in one or the other direction. Yeah, I agree. It's almost a balance between sort of human arrogance and hubris and just, you know, giving up on us completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But, but one right. of the one of one of the reasons some people are nervous about moving away from a supernatural or a religious worldview is because those worldviews can give, I think, a false but a reassuringly solid ethical structure and a moral structure, in that they will say ultimately good and bad is defined by the the instantiation of the deity or this list mm. of commandments <laughs> or rules or this book, yeah. and. And they, there can be some sensible wisdom in those things, but they can also go horribly off the rails as well. Yeah. But how was that something that was a, a concern for you as your faith shifted and faded away? And how would you describe you, the foundation for your morality now? And how has that evolved? If, yeah. If it has a foundation. It was a concern, but honestly, so I, I name checked this a little while ago without without focusing on it. One of the things that shook me up initially was the Euthyphro dilemma. So this is, yeah. you might be familiar, a Plato dialogue where Socrates encountered this guy, Euthyphro, I think on the, the steps of a courthouse. And Euthyphro was in the process of testifying against his father for murder, I believe. And Socrates said, wow, if you are testifying against your own father, you, you must really understand the nature of the good and the holy, the, the, the nature, in other words, of morality. I hope this is right. This is based on the 20 year old memory. <laughs> so, so please, everybody go read the youth okay, look it yourself up, yeah. and, and do your homework. Yeah. So Socrates said, wow, you must really know the nature of the good, the holy. And so let me ask you some questions. And, and, and the question, the fundamental question that Socrates asked Euthyphro was, okay, suppose for the sake of discussion that the holy, the good, is that which the gods command. Which is responsible for the other? Is the holy because the gods command it, or do the gods command it because it is holy? And the reason why when you ask that question, it can expose attention in religious metaethics is because either answer seems unsatisfying. On one hand, if the holy is holy, simply because the gods command it, then that means that the gods commands are in and of themselves completely necessarily arbitrary. Yeah. The gods cannot have any reason for saying murder is bad and telling the truth is good because that would presuppose a prior objective set of values that the gods are drawing from. So the gods literally have to be flipping a coin or choosing radically freely that, okay, murder is bad and, and honesty is good and so on and so forth. Yeah. And um, as, so that as, seems, and as part of that, one of those arbitrary choices could be to cause breathtaking levels of needless suffering. But by definition, yeah. that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Well, it, it could have been had the gods chosen to command that because yeah. again, they have no reason for making one command or another. And so then if on the other hand, you say, the gods command it because it is holy. They see that honesty is good and murder is bad and they mm. command accordingly. Then that sounds fine. But then that implies that there actually is a prior and in independent moral order that already exists and that the gods are looking to and drawing from and expressing to us. So either way, the the theistic meta, meta ethics, the, the, this idea that the gods commands are the source of morality starts to get a little bit undercut. Either, yeah. either it will be totally arbitrary or the gods will really be a messenger for this independent moral system rather than the originator, the source of the moral system. So that was the Euthyphro problem. 
And because that was one of the things that, that shook me up a little bit, I actually did not fully have my values shaken up too. Because part of what I was thinking was, oh, you know what? Option B sounds a little bit more plausible to me. This idea that values exist independently of the gods or God. And the reason I should listen to God is not that God is creating the values, but rather God is really smart. And I should defer to God as an authority, like as, yeah. as an epistemic superior, somebody who, who knows the truth and can tell me what the truth is. Um, so that made me think, well, even if God is dead, <laughs> yeah. then this objective or, or independent set of values might still exist. So my belief in God was shaken, but because the youth pro problem was part of what shook it, my belief in values yeah. remained. You'd, and, you'd, and lost so, the, you'd lost the interpreter or the teacher, but the foundation yeah. was stable, yeah. Yeah. Now, the question conti- persisted, what then is the nature of these values? Are yeah. the values real? Are they in some sense socially constructed? So that, of course, is a further question. But without knowing what the answer to that question was yet, I, I had a sense that there was an answer forthcoming that I could believe whether or not I believed in God. Yeah. And how would you summarize your views on that topic now in terms of what is a moral good or a moral bad? Or what is the root of value if there is a root yeah. to it? If it's easy to yeah. summarize. <laughs> yeah. I am reluctant to offer a very specific view because I think that people understand different views in different ways and have all sorts of associations with them. I can tell you yeah. what my main answer is, but then there'll be all sorts of qualifications. Yeah, of so my main answer is what philosophers call <laughs> uh, formal constructivism, which is a kind of anti-realism. And, and basically the, the idea here is that values are not objective, absolute, things that already exist in the world waiting to be discovered and followed. Values are instead things that we create for ourselves and then guide our lives by. Yeah. So yeah, floating out there in the ether waiting for humanity. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So realists, this is a simplification, but realists hold that there are objective moral truths and then our task is to discover them and follow them. And anti-realists hold that there are not objective moral truths, or if there are, we can't know about them, or even if we can, we don't care about them. And so either way, what morality is about is figuring out what our own most deeply held beliefs and values are, uh, so that we can live as authentically as possible. And that is is much closer to my view. So I do have strong moral commitments, but those moral commitments are grounded in this idea that morality is something that we all as individuals create for ourselves by believing things and valuing things and doing things. And our moral commitments come out of those beliefs and values and practices. Yeah. Yeah. And w- one challenge I have with, cause I, th- I think I probably share a very similar view and I don't think that there is some sort of platonic set of truths floating out there in the ether. I don't think before the existence of sentient life, I don't think there was such a thing as morality at all. So I'm I'm not a moral realist in the sense that it's independent of sentient beings or humans uh, uh, at all. But I guess I do have a hesitation about some of the sort of constructivist approaches Mm -hmm. in that how do we avoid them in the same way as religious ethic decided by a god might be arbitrary how can we avoid a constructed morality slipping into a sort of relativistic view where there is no good or bad it's beyond what a community happens to negotiate so do you want the short medium or long (laughs) answer to that question i I want the long but maybe with the time let's go let's go for the medium and (laughs) see how we go (laughs) so in general there are two possible answers to that question a constructivist can offer the, the first, which is the sort of Christine Korsgaard approach, uh, the substantive constructivist approach, is to say that a feature of agency makes it the case that there is something in particular that you have to value if you value anything at all. Mm-hmm. So every agent, merely in virtue of being an agent at all, believing or valuing or doing anything as an agent at all, thereby necessarily commits themselves to valuing something in particular. Yeah. And, and so for Korsgaard, it does all 
bottom out and our own individual beliefs and values and practices. But because of the nature of agency, we all end up necessarily through our agency committing ourselves to the same basic set of values. So there is on that approach, a universal set of values, even though what makes it universal is that every possible agent will independently converge on that set yeah. of values. That is one option, which I am sympathetic with, but ultimately a little bit skeptical that it can work, at least when it comes to real substantive values that guide our everyday choices. Mm. The second approach, uh, which I associate with Sharon Street and, and others, is the formal constructivist approach, which recognizes that for various contingent reasons, there will be lots of overlap in our values. Mm -hmm. We all are members of the same species. We share evolutionary history. We share all sorts of behavioral and physiological features. We share lots of cultural features with many differences and so on and so forth. And, and because of all of those contingent similarities as well as some other things, we can expect that broadly speaking, there will be uh, a rough convergence or overlap with respect to what we would all believe and value and choose to do if we were fully informed and ideally coherent. Yeah. However, there is nothing that makes that the case necessarily. We can at least conceive of an individual agent who's subjective motivational set beliefs and values would be so radically different from most of ours that they genuinely would, if fully informed and ideally coherent, want to do things that we regard as horrible. And for Korsgaard, she says, that is inconceivable. Everyone has okay. to value the things that I say we value. And, and for Street, she says, no, that is conceivable, but also very rare. We can proceed yeah. in our everyday lives on the assumption that most of us, our disagreements can be a result of like ignorance about something or irrationality about something. If we iron that out, we can roughly converge. And if we ever discovered an ideally coherent Caligula, someone who really, if fully informed and ideally coherent would want to go around torturing people for fun, then we can acknowledge that they are doing the right thing by their lights, but we can also acknowledge that we would be doing the right thing to make them stop yeah. and teach our kids yeah. not to be like them and so I've, on and so I've, forth. I've said a similar thing to people before where they've said, why should I even choose to be moral? And I've said, you don't have to be, but the rest of us will constrain you. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that is a sense in which I think some kind of realism yeah. still makes sense. So even if foundationally values come from our beliefs and values and choices as individuals, we do still construct a, a shared set of norms that we aspire to guide our collective public life by. And I think it does make sense in some moments to describe those norms in moral terms. And I think a lot of ambiguity comes from the fact that a lot of us are using our own private values to guide our participation in constructing public norms and then using moral terms to refer to them both reasonably. Yeah. And, and so there's some ambiguity here, but both parts are necessary, I yeah. think. No, that's fascinating. Thank you. And my, and my common sense way through that is that while I'm not uh, a realist in the sort of pure sense, as we've described, yeah. my morals are still grounded in a naturalistic understanding of what it means to be a sentient being and mm -hmm. what experience what experiences are. So that's why I guess the grounding of my moral value comes back to the the valenced experience of sentient beings, or in mm -hmm. simple terms, suffering is bad, flourishing is good. <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah. obvious, but it, it, that's where it comes back to. And I think that still leaves a lot of flexibility about, and lots of difficult philosophical questions about how do you work out trade-offs or different competing interests and so on and so forth. But in very simple terms, it just says you have to acknowledge the moral value of each sentient being and mm -hmm. the, the quality of its own sentience as that being judges it which again, mm -hmm. I guess comes back mm -hmm. to suffering mm -hmm. and flourishing very. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with that so far. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's part of the intent is that it's so super basic that it's almost impossible to disagree with, although most of the people on the planet do, but, but then it, you know, there's right. so, so much left to fight over, but it's the idea is to try. I do for, for whatever it's worth. I, I, I do think that other perspectives about sufficient conditions for moral status or moral value are interesting and, and in some cases, but not all cases, reasonable. Um, so I am, my credence that sentientism is the correct and only theory of moral status is lower than one, yeah. but, but it is, I guess, 
relatively high when it comes to my yeah. philosophical commitments. And I think the, what, what that helps us do, hopefully, is it avoids the arbitrariness of a supernatural deistically defined view, but it also helps to avoid the arbitrariness of a sort of purely relativistic view, which says, for example, if a group of people in Iran have decided that it's morally good to throw gay people off roofs, mm. we can incontrovertibly and without hesitation condemn that because of the suffering it causes. Perhaps. So I, I agree that sentientism rules that kind of view out, but I think I disagree with you about the relevance of meta ethics here because yeah. I think that the sort of foundational values and theory of how how values are grounded operates so far in the background that it would just be a mistake to cite it in yeah. ordinary discussions yeah. about applied ethics. It would be like asking why is it raining today? And then citing string theory in order to answer <laughs> why it's raining. Yes, the rain might in some sense be grounded in facts about string theory, but there are so many levels of explanation. Yeah, it's in between so far removed. Rain. Yeah, that it would just be weird. It would be coming out of left field yeah. uh, and you would be skipping so many steps to cite. And, and, and I think the same thing is going on here. If, if you ask, why is it not okay to oppress a particular class of people? Mm. And then someone says, oh, because realism is true or constructivism is true mm. or expressivism is true. Um, then that would, to me, seem just as out of left field as using string theory to explain the rain. So, I agree, so I yeah. there I would. Um, it seemed it seemed like you were connecting them a little bit more directly. So I just wanted to note there might be a place where I would ex I, say the I, same thing a little bit differently. Yeah, I think it's entirely fair. And in, in in practical terms, I guess there's two things I come back to. One is the suffering of an individual is a moral negative that should not be needlessly caused. So however you want to dress that up, yeah. suffering is a bad thing, right? So right. we can put the meta ethics to one side, but Good. can't we at right. least agree yeah, that yeah. suffering is negative? And if something causes yes. needless suffering there. And, and the other interesting yeah. thing, which I'd, I'd love to get your story on is, is also that boundary of moral considerability as well, because that's often a, a tricky journey that mm -hmm. people go mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. And some people have a moral circle some people don't have a moral circle at all. Some people don't like the idea of a moral circle, but some people have a circle that you know, starts out with yeah. family and friends and nation. Technically, the human race, most countries have signed up to a universal declaration of human rights that accords moral consideration yeah. to all humans. Um, most humans will accord some moral consideration to companion animals and you know, yeah. the charismatic wildlife, but yeah, not to much else. But it would be interesting to know your journey as you thought more seriously, particularly about non-human animals and and, and the journey you've been on there. Yeah. And, and even to your point, whether there is a case for moral considerability beyond sentient beings too in the environmental space. Yeah, yeah. it's a great question. Uh, so when it comes to my own journey, I, you know, I was basically normal American, statistically speaking, in the sense that I, I grew up eating meat and caring about my cat and not really thinking about animals very much beyond that, except feeling sad when a cute animal with big eyes was killed in an animated movie and yeah. so on and so forth. And then I went to college and I had my, my faith <laughs> shaken up. Uh, and then I kept studying philosophy in order to resolve some of those questions. And, and that led me to ethics. And, and that was what I really fell in love with. It was ethics and existentialism, which yeah. <clears throat> mapped onto <clears throat> my practical commitments and my like deeper theoretical commitments. And I think to my credit, I was persuaded by Singer and Regan and Rachel's and some other people we read in my first year of college, I was persuaded pretty much right away that sentience is, if not necessary, then at the very least sufficient yeah. for moral status. However, not to my credit, I think it took me maybe a year and a half or two years to go vegetarian and then eventually vegan. Yeah. But, but once I eventually did that, I leaned into this topic more, and I think that was in part just for contingent social reasons. There happened to be student groups at Texas Christian University at the time about most issues one should care about, but not about animal issues. And so I just saw value in, in doing more organizing around animal issues to complement what other people were doing. And so I went in that direction and that helped me create an identity as someone who is at least partly an animal advocate. And I went from there. So yeah, the sentientism started in college and then solidified over time mm -hmm. from there. And I never really went back from there. 
as for whether I would be open to there being other sufficient conditions for moral status other than sentience, I guess there are a couple of different ways of thinking about this. So one is that I am quite open-minded about what the scope of sentience itself is. If, if we understand <clears throat> sentience as the capacity to consciously experience positive or negative subjective states like pleasure and pain, then knowing which beings are sentient requires knowing which beings are conscious, which is a very difficult thing to know, arguably yeah. an impossible thing to know. And, you know, so I am open to the possibility that plants are sentient, that insects, of course, are sentient, that non-living beings like artificial intelligences can be sentient. Maybe even that all matter is in some <laughs> minimal sense sentient. Yeah. I am open to those possibilities because I am open to the possibility that various theories of consciousness are true, some of which are more general than others. Yeah. So that is one source of deep uncertainty about moral status. And that would not be uncertainty about sentientism. It would said be uncertainty about the scope of sentience and, yes. and which beings are sentient. With that said, I am receptive to the idea that sentientism is just another case of expanding the moral circle in a way that ultimately selects a feature that happens to be important to us mm. as the feature that grounds moral status for everyone and everything. And that has not been a good strategy in the past when yeah. the features we picked out involved like race or gender or class yeah. or nationality yeah. or species or whether like someone is a vertebrate more. or an invertebrate. Yeah. So I don't think that is a decisive argument for going beyond sentientism, but I do think that it is a reminder that we have never in the history of our species been right and expansive enough yeah. in our thinking about this. And it would probably be arrogant to think that for the first time we finally had it exactly. So that is where my my open-mindedness comes from. Yeah, thank you. And it comes, ba comes back to that humility point you mentioned earlier on, that open-mindedness. And uh, yeah, just never being too confident you're right, because we know that leads to bad places. And on the scope of sentience, I, I share that open-mindedness. Um, and sentientism itself doesn't have a list of and here are the types of being or entity that are sentient. So sentientists disagree radically right. over where the boundaries are. And, and those boundaries right. are likely to be fuzzy, as with many useful concepts. My mm -hmm. personal view tends to follow, I guess, a, a, a more traditional line that suggests that sentience is likely to have evolved through an evolutionary drive to have, have an a survival advantage in being able to model the self as an entity and an reasonably advanced way operating in an environment. So I tend to, and there, as you say, there's a real danger here that because our perspective is by definition human and we are viscerally aware of our own sentience that we use that as a frame of reference inappropriately yeah. and we accidentally anthropomorphize. Even though sentience is trying to break anthropomorphism and saying, look, sentience existed long before humans even existed. Let's try and use a characteristic that is not defined by human humanity yeah. our perspective by definition is human of course so i tend to think of it in terms of there either needs to be an evolutionary rationale for it to have come into existence or a potentially a design rationale i, I think as you say there's no right. reason as yeah. our capabilities develop we might be able to eventually design something that is sentient secondly that there is um there is a you can infer sentience through behavior and the way you and I are interacting leads me to have very high confidence, not 100%, but very high confidence that you're sentient. So there are behavioral inferences, but again, with risk of bias there, of course, and self serving. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, architectural inference. So you, you know, put us in an fMRI scanner and look for analogs and so on. But again, it's inference rather than direct. So yes, I think right. all, all of those assessments. So for me, Again, I, I won't put percentages on it, but if someone said in common sense terms, what do you think is sentient? I would say, you know, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, lots of in, insects and invertebrates, mm. gray areas around the very, very simple invertebrates. Uh, I Personally, I'd probably draw the line at plants because I don't see enough evidence there, but stay open-minded. And I think that's the point. You've got to retain that humility, re keep open-minded, open to new evidence, and you know, yeah. we might be surprised. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the evolutionary argument is really interesting. And one of the things that most confuses me, I think that j as a general topic, not what you said about it, <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely see the 
evolutionary value of evolving an ability to detect harmful stimuli and avoid harmful stimuli. Mm -hmm. I definitely see the evolutionary value of the ability to monitor internal states so that, that you can then also regulate internal states. But what always gets left out of these explanations is why it has to come along with phenomenal consciousness. Like yeah. why in addition to the monitoring and behavioral adjustment, it also has to feel like something. There, there has to be something it is like to be you yeah. doing that monitoring and doing that adjusting. That is always the part that is is hardest to capture in the evolutionary explanations and and that is is just one of the reasons why consciousness is such a hard problem in science and philosophy and it's a fascinating topic because some people see that by definition as a really hard problem you know mm. and potentially yeah. even intractable and other people yeah. and i'm more in this camp mm. tend to see it not um not really as a problem in its own right. So that I, and it may seem trite, and it will seem trite to people who think the hard problem is a hard problem. I just think that consciousness is what it feels like to run this particular class of information processing. But for, so for me, that feels straightforward and there's no evidence of anything beyond patterns of information processing and matter and energy and what's going on. There may be, I've seen no evidence. Of that. For other people, as you said, that leaves out the most important phenomenon, which is the, yeah. the experience of consciousness itself. So it's a fascinating well, topic. Well, you might be right. I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you. That is all consciousness is a sort of epiphenomenal yeah. like experience of a certain process running. But what would still be called for is the evolutionary explanation of that epiphenomenal yeah. experience. Why does it feel and, like anything? <laughs> and epistemologically, the ability to confirm that anyone other than you is having <laughs> yeah. that experience and what, what the limits are. In, in any case, the, the other thing I wanted to briefly mention was if sentience is tied to this construction of a sense of self, then that sounds to me like a higher order theory of consciousness, which, which says consciousness arises at the point where you evolve the ability to have mental states about other mental states. So like thoughts about your mm. thoughts or in a more minimal form, perceptions of your perceptions, like awareness of your attention or something like that. And that has been controversial just as a theory of consciousness, because some people think consciousness is less complicated and more immediate yeah. than that, but also as a theory of consciousness in a moral context, because you might think that the bar for which organisms can have mental states about other mental states is higher than the bar for which organisms can have mental states. Yeah. And, and so that like theory of consciousness underlying your view of sentience might result in a more restrictive moral circle yeah. than yeah. other theories of consciousness underlying sentientism, depending on how you interpret the details. I'm not saying that's wrong. I just think that is interesting and, and yeah. might be worth discussing more at some point. I agree. And I tend to use part of the reason I like the idea of focusing on sentience rather than consciousness. Some people do use them as synonymous is that I think sentientism, sentience almost sets a lower bar. It just says, it goes back to the Bentham idea of can they suffer? And mm. you can layer on other ideas about awareness of the suffering or awareness of the self as an entity over time or oh. so on and so forth. But it's almost just stripping everything out and saying, is there a subjective ah. awareness of something that's negative or positive. Oh, so you, okay, this exposes a difference between us, maybe just a terminological difference, but so I think of sentience as implying consciousness. If you are sentient, then you are also conscious. Yeah. What sentience is for me is the ability to consciously experience positive and negative states like pleasure and pain, because without the consciousness part, all you would be doing is like algorithmically detecting things that are good or bad for you, given your yeah. like programmed goals without there being any felt like part. Yeah. And I'm not sure there is, uh, I'd love there to be a difference because we're supposed to fight on YouTube, but yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure there is, because I think my conception of sentience is absolutely an, a subjective awareness of, 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 of valent state. So it is an experience mm. of, of suffering. I guess it just doesn't include some of, or it doesn't require some of the other higher order things that some people will include in a description of consciousness. I see. So, but it, so but it, it is a, it is absolutely an awareness. It's a there is something experiencing the so it, the suffering. Got it. So sentience for you doesn't in necessarily include mental states about other mental states. 
So it doesn't necessarily yeah. include consciousness if you accept a higher order theory of consciousness. I think so. Uh, yeah. What I would call self consciousness. Yeah, got it, yeah. got I think it. so. We're probably reaching the limits of my. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. I, it's always interesting to clarify these things. This is the point where talking in person actually helps us get a little bit farther in our yeah. understanding of each other Absolutely. than our little Twitter exchanges. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm keeping an eye on the clock as well. I don't want to run over too long. So it would be really interesting to come on to the, the final section of the conversation, which is if we could, we're in this odd state where I think there are certain things that seem reasonably solid in our belief system and our ethics and our morals about being open-minded being guided by evidence and reason, but not kidding ourselves, they're perfect. Mm-hmm. And at least recognizing the moral salience of any being that is able to have some sort of subjective conscious awareness and seeing them as needlessly harming them as negative. And while those things seem reasonably commonsensical and obvious, most people on the planet disagree with us on one or the other or both. They have a much narrower moral circle or they mm-hmm. have a, uh, you know, a different mode of epistemological thinking that believes in things for which I don't see there is evidence. So if you imagine a world where magically we could, being a good naturalist, I shouldn't talk about magic, but but we could persuade more of the 8 billion people on the planet to shift towards our ways of thinking epistemologically and ethically, what do you think that future could look like? And what levers are are we best placed to pull to move towards that? And you can think long-term sci-fi or more immediate touching some of the existing work you're doing? Yeah, I think that we, so this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. My my current book in progress is about including animals in public policy uh, by considering their interests along, of course, with our interests when we make all sorts of public policy decisions regarding health and the environment and social services and infrastructure and so on. Yeah, And, and that does raise lots of questions about what would, a multi-species political society ideally look like. And, and I do think that we are not anywhere close to being able to offer an informed answer to that question. Yeah. And, and one issue that we really need to wrap our heads around is, should we approach answering that question on the model of extending our current framework so that they cover animals as well? Or should we approach it on the model of replacing our current frameworks with brand new frameworks and, and so on. So for example, should we extend personhood and citizenship and current forms of representation with appropriate modifications? Yeah. Democracy, to liberalism. Right. Liberalism, democracy, capitalism. Should we extend those things to animals to make them more inclusive? Mm. Or should we recognize that these were concepts and frameworks and structures that were built by and for not only humans, but a, a small subset of privileged humans yeah. and start from scratch if our aspiration is to create a just multi-species society that equitably considers the interests and rights of everybody. And, in, and it's interesting you laid out those two alternatives because I was yeah. almost thinking you'd say, do we extend, do we create separate for, and mm-hmm. for non-humans or do we create from mm-hmm. scratch and integrate? And Oh yeah, right. Yeah, that is a third option. That, or create from scratch and right. and have separate. But yeah, I tend to think there will ultimately need to be some sort of unified foundation yeah. for political society, and then obviously different particular norms for human and non-human animals because of our different interests and needs and vulnerabilities. And but yeah, yeah I, I do tend to not be very sympathetic with the idea that even at the foundations, there should just be one set of like legal and political norms for humans and another set for non-humans. That seems arbitrary and species to me. Mm. But yes, it is an option too. And, and we should keep many options on the table right now. So I think it'll take a long time to know which of these approaches is best for particular states and particular contexts. And so right now, I really am in favor of a, a somewhat constrained both and approach where we have some people working on one and some people working on the other. And we all support and celebrate each other's work. And we find uh, short to medium term goals that we can overlap and, and compromise and converge on and work together on things like reducing support for activities that harm animals like factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade, and by the way, harm public health and yeah. the environment, and increase support for non human animals, both because their suffering matters and because non human animals are increasingly victims of human activity. And so we have r- reparative duties to them to improve their lives. To, to reduce and repair the harm that we cause to them. And that might include things like I mentioned before, 
including animals and social services decisions, infrastructure, education, employment, just transitions for workers during a Green New Deal. So I think there are certain not very controversial things without wading into whether we should kill predators or yeah. genetically engineer animals. We can have that fight at some point. But right now we can converge on a lot of practical, common sense, mutually advantageous solutions that improve human and non-human and environmental health. And I think the act of doing that will help us to build knowledge and power and political will that will make us better equipped in a generation or two to go farther and tackle harder questions. So I think we should have a sense that the future needs to look really different from the present. We need to have a sense of what we can do to start figuring things out more. Uh, and then we should just try to stay as open-minded as possible about the goals while we work on stuff in the short term and figure stuff out. Yeah, I think that's an, uh, a beautiful balance because there's so much noise and heat and light and uncertainty in all of the many complex philosophical debates and advocacy de debates as well. But quite often the most fundamental questions and the and the most urgent solutions are blindingly obvious, right? They really mm -hmm. are. And we can find common ground in really unexpected places. So even many people yeah. who continue to consume animal products are viscerally against factory farming. Yeah. Fine, let's work together, find consensus, move forward on the really yeah. obvious high priority stuff, which in many people will frame these discussions as a sort of win-lose trade-off. And then they're, they're just not. Things like yeah. bringing an end to factory farming are a win-win-win. They're a win for non-human animals, they're a win for wild animals, they're a win for humans, human animals, they're a win yeah. for the environment. You know, almost whatever your value system is, it's, yeah. it's a no-brainer, despite the social norms that trap us into those patterns. I completely agree. And the, the caveat is that there are nevertheless some trade-offs that, I, yeah. and I know you agree with this, that we need to be mindful of. So for example, even though ending factory farming is clearly best for everyone in the aggregate by a wide margin, there are some farmers and workers and consumers who currently depend on animal agriculture and, and whose interests will be damaged in the short term if we transition away from it thoughtlessly, which is, of course, not a reason not to transition away from it, but is rather a reason to transition away from it thoughtfully. <laughs> yes, you use the term uh, just so, transition and... Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think it is good and important to acknowledge trade-offs where they exist, but not yeah. to overestimate them and, and exaggerate how um, dominant they are. Yeah. And the approaches you laid out before I liked as well, because it keeps open that sort of utopian thinking that we, we might need to restart, rethink this stuff from scratch and do things in a radically different way. But for now, there's lots of different ways we can progress things forward and make things more positive. Yeah. And I've done a couple of amateurish thought experiments myself on that sort of extend and then rewrite model. So I took the sustainable development mm. goals and just rewrote the top level as if mm. they'd been written for all sentient beings. And I took the Universal mm. Declaration of Human Rights and rewrote that as a universal declaration of sentient rights and interesting while there were some areas where obviously it didn't make sense you need to adjust for different capabilities there might be rights or certain initiatives that don't make sense for non-human animals what i was shocked by is how easy it was because again the most fundamental interests that we share that, that we have as humans are also the ones that we share with non-human animals you know the, the ones yeah. at the base level of the hierarchy the security sustenance wanting to be free from physical harm, bodily integrity, all of that, all of the most important ones that even we as humans acknowledge are most important are the most fundamental, they're the most widely shared. So yeah. it was a remarkably easy exercise just to extend some of that stuff out as a thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. But I was left with the thought that, yeah, it would be better to rewrite the Universal Declaration of, hum of Sentient Rights from scratch rather than just extend it. But it's quite interesting how easy yeah. it is to do. Yeah, I think that is interesting and, and good because those statements can matter. There are a lot of places right now that are including those sorts of revised statements in their constitutions yeah. or their laws, like Mexico City's new constitution now includes text that says animals are sentient beings and we have moral and legal obligations to them. And that is wonderful. You know, uh, that, that can easily be extended and, and modified. Of course, what is less easy is then figuring out how to reshape your social and political and economic yeah. systems so that it lives up to that stated aspiration. And that is where most of these places that have that text in their laws are falling short right now. And I think also why most judges and lawmakers are willing to accept such bad arguments for rejecting that good revised language because they, yeah. they know that it'll create this dissonance between yeah. what we say and what we do. They and they have coming. no idea what to do about that. Yeah. yeah. But I think 
stating our aspirations is a good first step and and then figuring out how to live up to them is what we can do next. I agree. And does that leave you in an optimistic cast of mind generally? What's your sense about how quickly we can drive some of these changes? Or... <laughs> I think whether to be optimistic or pessimistic is in part a moral question, not just an epistemic question. Yeah. Because, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic you are is going to shape your behavior and then shape your impacts. And in general, the way that I think about this is that as with hubris and and humility, you need to strike a balance here and especially avoid being too optimistic or too pessimistic because both of those can be rationalizations for inaction. If if you are very optimistic about the future, then you might think we don't need to change all that much. We can change a little bit and then everything will work out. Uh, And that takes the pressure off. And if you're very pessimistic, you might think no matter how much we do, it won't make a difference. So we might as well just have fun while the world burns. And and that takes the pressure off. I think the reality and the most morally useful way to think about things is to appreciate that change is possible, but hard (laughs) and unlikely that we have to work really hard in order to have a chance of maybe making a difference. And that's a little bit demoralizing, but I think that is where the truth is and, and the kind of view that I, I at least want to be trying to internalize. Yeah, change is possible, but hard. That's been a fascinating, inspirational conversation. Thank you, Jeff, so much for yeah, talking to me today. Yeah, thank you. This is a really fun conversation. I appreciate your doing it. And thanks for doing the series in general. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What's the best way of people following you and keeping up with your work and buying your new book when it comes out? <laughs> well, hopefully Google will be enough for all of that. Yeah. My, my name is Jeff Sebo, S E B. Oh, and you can find me at jeffsebo.net. You can email me at jeffsebo.net wait, (laughs) gmail.com. And and then you can find me on Twitter and all that stuff too. Where I found you. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, I'll I'll include all those in the show notes as well. So people can follow you and keep up to date with your work. It's been great to have the conversation. It's an honor to have you in our Facebook group as well. And uh, I'll I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks again. Cheers, Jeff.